Well, it's Christmas season. Some of us still got some Christmas shopping to do, huh? Maybe some of you are, are looking for those good last-minute deals like me. Even better after Christmas, right? <laughs> well, uh, I discovered this story uh, this last week of this one guy who got this amazing deal. He got way more than he paid for. Uh, he went to a, a local Goodwill, and he was looking for things for his house. Uh, he bought some candles, probably some last-minute gifts for his wife or mother, and uh, some salt sh shaker and, and a, a pepper shaker, and he bought a copy of the Declaration of Independence. Everybody's different. I don't know. Well, he brought this, uh, this document home, and as he was looking it over, he thought maybe this document's a little bit older than he originally thought. So he got on the internet and started doing some research. And the more research he did, he discovered that in his possession was one of the original 200 copies of the Declaration of Independence. Yes. And these documents are even more rare because there's actually only 36 that are still in existence. He bought these items for $2.40. He turned around and at an auction and sold this document for $478,000. Wow. What, what a story, right? I mean, you never know what you're going to find at Goodwill. You never know. What one person's junk is another person's treasure, I guess. In some ways, this story kind of reminds me a little bit of what we see in the story of Jesus. Jesus was born in a small village in Judea with very little fanfare. As a matter of fact, we know that he was born in a barn. Now talk about a lack of respect. The Son of God, the Messiah, was born in a stable in a barn. And he wasn't welcomed by the elite or luminaries. He was welcomed by a group of stinky shepherds who had just came out of the field. He was also welcomed by a, a, a three foreign astrologers who, who were following a star. What we see in this amazing story about Jesus is that Jesus Christ, though he was laid to rest, took naps in a manger, was actually the mighty God the king of heaven and earth. Isn't that amazing? I'm, I'm always amazed at the story of Christmas, that God came to earth. Last week, we started uh, our series in Isaiah chapter 9. Go ahead and open your Bibles, Isaiah 9. Uh, there's Bibles in the rows in front of you if you want to follow along. And we've been talking about this amazing prophecy that Isaiah gave us of the Messiah. In this prophecy, he talks about the names of what the Messiah will be called. Last week, we talked about the first name, Wonderful Counselor. And we talked about the fact that Jesus, the Messiah, as Wonderful Counselor, possesses divine wisdom. But not only does he have divine wisdom, but he has compassion for those who are in need. He also is willing to speak the truth boldly to guide people to salvation. So with these characteristics that Jesus has, we can trust him as our wonderful counselor. Amen? Amen. He is trustworthy. This morning, we're going to look at that second name that the Messiah is called, Mighty God. If you found Isaiah 9, we're going to look at verses 2 through 7. And if you're able, if you'd like to stand, we're going to go ahead and read those verses together this morning. Isaiah says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. 
You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Would you pray with me? Lord, what a blessing it is to, to have this incredible prophecy in Isaiah 9 that talks about your coming, that talks about who you are as our Savior and Lord. God, I pray uh, this morning as we look at this, this name, Mighty God, I pray that you would speak to us, uh, Lord, that you would say to us what it is that we want to hear, that we would know that you truly are the mighty God that we can depend on. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There's an outline in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along this morning. As we talked about last week, Isaiah starts off with his prophecy about this incredible idea that the people were living in darkness, but that light would come into their darkness. John chapter 1 says, Jesus is the light of the world, and he shines in the darkness. Isaiah talks about the fact that when the Messiah comes, the people of God who are in a place of distress, a place of mourning, will experience joy and peace. They'll experience joy like people experiencing a harvest or soldiers coming back from battle, a victorious battle, and that this Savior will lift the rod from their backs. This Savior will free them. And the objects that were used for war will no longer be needed. They'll be burned and put away. I just love that picture that, that Isaiah gives us there. He goes on to talk about that this child will grow to be a man and he will sit on the throne of David. And that his reign will usher in a time of righteousness and justice for the world forever. I don't know about you, but our world can use some justice and righteousness. I look forward to that day when Jesus Christ descends to this earth and, and he establishes his throne in Jerusalem and, and every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? Amen. Well, this is not just good news for Israel. It's good news for the whole world. But was this child born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago the eternal king that Isaiah was prophesying about? And how do we know that Jesus is the mighty God that we see in this prophecy? Well, the first thing that we see is that Jesus' words testified to the fact he was mighty God. When Jesus Christ was on this earth, beyond a shadow of a doubt, he claimed that he was God. There are people out there that'll tell you, you know what? Jesus never claimed that he was God. Yeah, he was a good man. He might have been a prophet, but Jesus never claimed he was God. Well, look at this passage in John chapter 8. It might be hard to look at because I can't even read it. I'll have to read it to you. In John chapter 8, the Jews were, were questioning Jesus. 
the Jews asked Jesus if he was greater than their father Abraham. And look what Jesus says. He says, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Jesus said, you know what? What I say about myself, it doesn't really matter. What matters is, is that the Father is glorifying me. The one that you claim to be your God, you don't know him, but I know him. And Abraham, who you call father, Abraham spoke of me. Abraham foresaw my coming. Well, the Jews said to him, what are you talking about? You say you, you, you know Abraham, you're not even 50 years old. What are you talking about? And Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am. Well, there's two things that you need to know about those two words, I am. The first thing you need to know is that by saying those words, Jesus was saying that he existed before Abraham. He was saying he always existed. The second thing you need to know is that through those two words, Jesus Christ was claiming to be deity. It was well known amongst the Jews that the name I am was only a name given to God. Now, we can go back to the story in Exodus. Do you remember the story in Exodus when, when God called Moses to go back to Egypt to release his people? And, and Moses was afraid. He said, when I go back to Israel, who should I tell them has sent me? And God said to, him, said to Moses, tell them I am has sent you. When the Jewish leaders heard Jesus say those words, that's why they picked up the stones to stone him because he was, in their eyes, committing blasphemy. There's another place in, in John 10 where, where the Jews, the, the Jewish leaders wanted to stone Jesus. And in verses 31 to 32, it says, again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. There it is. I mean, it's very clear. They wanted to kill Jesus because he claimed to be God. Later on, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he had a, a final conversation with his disciples, and, and he wanted them to know that he was the only way to the Father. Only through a relationship with Jesus could you be reconciled to the Father. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? Jesus wanted his disciples to clearly know that he and the Father were one. That he was mighty God like the Father was mighty God. That they were the same. Well, if you don't believe Jesus' testimony, then you have to look at the testimony of Apostle Paul. Look what Paul says in Colossians 1.15. He says, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For God was pleased to have all in his fullness dwell in him. When Jesus Christ came to this earth over 2,000 years ago, 
God became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's the good news for all of us. All the fullness of God dwelled in Jesus. He was completely God in every way possible. What's obvious that Scripture testifies that Jesus is God. That's the obvious testimony of Scripture. But the question I have for you today is, do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus is mighty God? And if you believe Jesus is mighty God, then how does it affect the way you live your life? One more time. If you believe that Jesus is mighty God, how does it affect the way you live your everyday life? I would hope that our lives would be different. If we believe that Jesus is on the throne and that he is God, Well, the second reason for believing that Jesus is mighty God is his miracles demonstrated he was mighty God. What we see in the Gospels that Jesus had authority over both the physical realm and also the spiritual realm. One of my favorite stories is the story in in Mark 4. Jesus and his disciples were out in a boat on the Sea of Galilee, and the winds started to pick up, and the waves started crashing over the side of the boat, and and Jesus' disciples, they start getting nervous. They start looking at each other, and they start thinking, man, maybe this boat is going down. And where's Jesus? He's taking a nap in the bottom of the boat, right? Right? These guys think they're about ready to die, and Jesus is taking a nap. Well, they wake Jesus up, and he comes out there, and, you know, in in his gentle, humble way, as Jesus always related to his disciples, and Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves. Jesus has power over the wind and the waves. Another story I love is the story in in Mark 2. Jesus is is having a Bible study in somebody's house, and and everybody had heard about it, and the house is packed with people. But there's a group of men. They have a friend who's paralyzed. They can't get him close to Jesus, so they come up with an idea. They climbed up on the top of the roof, and they started tearing off the shingles. Ingenious, I guess. One by one, they start tearing off the, the, the whatever, whatever material was on the roof. They're tearing it off, and, and slowly they lower their friend down on a mat. And Jesus, the Son of God, in his patience, heals the paralyzed man, and he walks. Mark 8 tells us Jesus gave sight to the blind. John 11 tells us that Jesus raised Lazarus back to life after he'd been dead for four days. Jesus clearly demonstrated that he had authority over nature, over the physical realm. And why shouldn't he? Paul tells us in Colossians 1, back to Colossians, For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth. Oops, back one. Back one slide. Okay. That's all right. Paul Paul clearly tells us Jesus created everything. Everything was created through him. Uh, Things on heaven, things on earth. There we are. All things are created by him and for him. So if Jesus created everything, if everything was created through him, then he has authority over the physical realm, which shows us that he is mighty God. But Jesus didn't only have authority over the physical realm. He had authority over the spiritual realm also. 
Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. You can put a, a marker in Isaiah and flip over to, to Mark 5 real quick. In Mark 5, we, we see Jesus taking a boat across the Sea of Galilee to the Gerasenes. And when Jesus comes to this land, he encounters a man who was possessed by demons, okay? Now, this man wasn't just possessed by one demon. He was possessed by a legion of demons. And Mark tells us this man lived like a maniac, like a wild man. He ran around naked, didn't have any clothes on. He, he lived in a, in a cemetery. And he was so dangerous to others and himself that they chained him up. But he kept breaking the chains. One of the things I love about Jesus is that the people that society casts off those people that, that society says, you know what, give up on them. There's nothing you can do about it. Jesus Christ in his power goes to those people. He wants to save those people. And that's what we see in this story. Jesus sees this man that, that, that his own village had cast off and Jesus sees this man as an opportunity for salvation. Mark tells us in, in verse 6, it says, When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out. And went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind. Wow! What a story. One of the amazing things to me in this story is that the townspeople, they don't know who Jesus is. They don't know what his true identity is, but the demons do. The, the demons know exactly who Jesus is. As a matter of fact, when Jesus arrives, they start getting into a place of fear. And when Jesus comes to the man, they say, what do you want with us, son of the most high God? The demons knew exactly who Jesus was. That he was the son of God. And Jesus cast those demons out of that man to show the power that Jesus had. Those demons went into that herd of pigs and they ran off the hill. 2,000 pigs were drowned. Man, that's a lot of pigs. That's going to affect the bacon economy. <laughs> and, and the shepherds of those pigs, they weren't happy about it, were they? But when they come back, they see this man who had been tortured who had been in bondage to Satan, set free, healed because of Jesus. Jesus is mighty God because 
He has authority over the physical realm. Jesus is mighty God because he has authority over the spiritual realm. There are other places in the Gospels where Jesus showed he had power over the forces of darkness. And friends, here's what I want to say to you this morning. If Jesus Christ has authority over the physical and spiritual realms, what is there for us to worry about? Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your burdens on him because he cares for you. Doesn't matter what your burden is, what your, your struggle is, whether it's a physical burden, maybe it's, maybe it's finances. Maybe you're wondering right now how God's gonna provide Maybe it's a spiritual issue, a particular addiction that you're struggling with or a broken relationship. Friends, no matter what it is, Jesus Christ has the power to meet you in that place and to set you free. That's our God. Lastly, this morning, It's his ultimate mission. His ultimate mission revealed he was mighty God. Jesus' ultimate purpose of reconciling the Father to his creation shows he is God. Back to Colossians 1, Paul talking about the mission of why Christ came. says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Remember, Jesus was completely God. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus Christ set aside the majesty of heaven and came to this earth as a baby. And friends, he had one purpose in mind, to reconcile you and I to the Father, to destroy the wall, the curse of sin that separated us from God. The Bible teaches that only God can forgive sin. Back to that story in Mark chapter 2 where the guys were tearing the roof off and they lowered their friend down and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And boy, when those words came out of Jesus' mouth, the the teachers of the law and the Jews, they they got into into a a tissy. They, they, They started getting angry. And they turned to each other and they said, did you hear what he just said? He just told that man that his sins are forgiven. And they said to each other, that's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sin. And you know what? They were absolutely right. Only God can forgive sin. In the Old Testament, God's way of dealing with sin required a sacrifice. The Israelites had to bring an unplemished bull an unblemished bull or a, or a sheep or a ram. And they would have to offer that sacrifice and, and the priests would come and they would lay their hands on that animal. And as the, the throat of the animal or the, the throat was being slit, the, the priest would take the blood and they would sprinkle it on the altar. Gruesome, right? Violent. Well, sin is a violent thing. When we sin, we're sinning against God. And so through this sacrifice, their sin would be atoned for, but it wouldn't be permanent. They would have to come back year after year after year to have their sin covered. Well, God said, you know what? I got a different plan. And in the new covenant, God instituted a plan that through his perfect son, 
sin would be atoned for once for all. Sin would be dealt with through his son. Paul in in 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin. Jesus had never sinned. When Jesus was on this earth, he was perfect. And friends, I'll tell you what, there's only one person or persons that are perfect, and that's God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Every single one of us have all sinned. Paul says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The only being that has never sinned is God himself. Jesus Christ, as the perfect sacrifice, took sin on his back so that if we believe in him, we might become the righteousness of God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wow. Sin was a big deal, friends. Can you imagine how many sins have been committed since Adam and Eve I mean, there's what, 7.8 billion people on our planet? And go back to the very beginning? Man, that's a lot of sin, isn't it? I can't atone for your sin. You can't atone for my sin. The only person that could atone for the sin of the world would be a perfect sacrifice. And that perfect sacrifice was Jesus because he was God. Well, that's the good news of the gospel message. Peter says in 1 Peter 3.18, he says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. That's the good news. Jesus' mission of coming and removing what Isaiah prophesied about, he came to remove the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, and that, and that bar and that yoke was sin. He came to remove it. And because Jesus came and because that was his mission, it shows that Jesus Christ is the mighty God, the king of the universe. When Gabriel came to to Joseph, Joseph was terrified when he found out that that Mary was pregnant. They were engaged, and he knew he wasn't the father. And Gabriel said to him, Joseph, don't be afraid, for the child that, that Mary bears is going to save the world. He said, call him Jesus. And Jesus, that name is the Greek word for Joshua. And Joshua means the Lord saves. And Gabriel went on to tell him that Jesus shall save his people from their sins. You know, this Christmas, you can choose to depend on Jesus, the Messiah, the mighty God, because, first of all, he is who he said he is, God Almighty. You can also depend on Jesus because Jesus has authority over the physical and spiritual realm. If you depend on me, I will let you down sooner or later because I'm a human being. But Jesus Christ is perfect. 
He will never let you down. Whatever it is you're dealing with, whatever it is that you're worried about, Jesus could handle it. And lastly, you can depend on Jesus because he has atoned for sin once for all. He's opened the door for you to have a relationship with the Father if you put your faith in him. The question I have in closing this morning is, what are you depending on? Where are you putting your faith? Are you putting your faith in yourself, in your own abilities? Are you putting your faith in somebody else, another person? Maybe it's a thing. Or are you putting your faith in the mighty God?